anyway, we are here today to talk about soil, and that can be a very sort of dry topic, and I hope to make it a little more exciting and interesting for you. Um, a couple of really nice quotes about soil. Soil is so important, it's just amazing, but to be a successful <coughs> farmer, you must first know the nature of the soil. So we're going to talk a little bit about that to increase your success, hopefully, and the success that your information you're going to pass on to others. And there's so many different varieties of soils out there. I think I read somewhere there's like 13,000 different types of soils in the world. And so we just think of it maybe as dirt or something very, you know, it's just there. We take it for granted. But it's very rich. It's very interesting. And many students that take our soil science class are so amazed that they really begin to understand what life is all about, what horticulture is all about by taking the soils class. Because once you understand that, everything else begins to make sense. I mean, even if you look at world geography many times, you know, you'll notice that certain parts of California have certain types of plant communities that grow here or grow there. But if you look at a soils map, oftentimes it parallels that distribution of the plants. And so you can actually match those two maps together, and you can maybe even see animal distribution. And all of it is related back to the soil. So whether it's shallow, red, black, sand, clay, it's the link between the rock core of the earth and the living things on the surface. So it really um, influences all of the life around us and what's found there naturally. Now, something that showed up in my Facebook <coughs> feed just yesterday I thought was really fun. It says, does dirt make you happy? <laughs> and is there a scientific reason that getting our hands dirty makes us feel good or getting your you know, shoes off and kind of walking barefoot? in the dirt and it they are actually doing research to see if there is some uh, they believe there's some microorganisms and fungi in there that actually do contribute to um, you know sometimes feel good chemicals in your body and just the bacteria the flora in there apparently have some influence so i think more research needs to be done but there was even a byline once that is soil the new prozac you know? <laughs> and last year was the year of the soil, I don't know if any of you caught that, but it was definitely an emphasis um, in the world. So today as we look at soil, we're going to be looking at how soil forms, so some of the rudimentary things to give you an understanding of that. And then we're going to look at the physical properties, the chemical properties, and then how you might manage your soil or just kind of figure out what you have, and that's why a lot of you brought samples in today and have your jars ready, I, I see. I hope you didn't do like me, and I carefully packaged it up and brought it, and when I arrived here, I looked to find it at all. Dump side, right? <laughs> it's not as pretty as it was last night, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about fertility, and then we'll get into our um, hands-on part of the class, and we're going to actually try to figure out and determine our texture, our structure of the can, and then also the pH. And these are three factors that, both physical and chemical, that really influence a lot about um, what's happening with the soil. So every author has a different definition of soil, but it's basically that layer of the Earth's crust that supports life. OK, so with that in mind, if we kind of look at a cross section of the planet Earth here, you can see that we've got the core, which is you know, thousands of miles deep, and other things. And then when you get to the actual soil, it's just this little black line in here between sort of the gray and the light gray. So the atmosphere, you know, miles and miles up above us. But it's a very thin layer, relatively speaking. And all of life on Earth depends on that thin layer. And it sometimes can take thousands of years to form naturally and we can destroy it very quickly. So we need to understand it and what a treasure it is and how important it is to our well-being in any country on Earth. If you have really good soils, you typically will have a really good economy. Your people will not starve. You know, you'll be the breadbasket of the world. So it's really important to learn about that. And we just happen to be blessed in the United States. Not every single part of it, but Many parts of it in our country as a whole have really excellent soil for farming and agriculture. So soils do a lot for us. And we'll, we'll take a look at some of these different um, types of activities. But as we talked about, it does sustain the plant life 
and also the animal life. And so again, there's a direct correlation to the type of soil, what type of plants can grow there, and of course, what type of animals will live there. Um, as we're finding out in this El Nino year, uh, soil is also regulating our runoff, drainage, also the amount of food that's going to actually infiltrate into the soil and percolate into that is really important. We like to slow down runoff as much as possible because that takes soil with it and washes it away and that could be one way we lose soil. On the other hand, sometimes at the end of the line there could be a place that's benefiting from that. So many of our valleys are very rich in soil because it's that transported soil that collected in those valleys and made them very fertile. But it took the topsoil away probably from somewhere else. So we actually like to keep that on site as much as possible and we now have stormwater regulations that require us to keep not only water but our soil on site. So you'll see construction sites around that will have you know, straw bales or, or wattles that are there to keep that soil in there or a siltation fence to keep it there because it's against the law basically to, you know, have runoff of especially soil from your property. So it's really important that you keep it where it goes. Um, there's lots of cycles that happen between the atmosphere and moisture and the, um, the soil. So there's things that are happening with nitrogen cycles, carbon cycles, all of that ends up in cycling somehow through the soil um, surface. So it filters, it buffers. It sometimes degrades or breaks down. It can immobilize and it can detoxify. So if we have toxic waste, actually the soil can help hold that, buffer it, keep it from getting into the groundwater. So we use our soil many times. And of course we use it to store nutrients and it's very involved in things like the nitrogen cycle and as I mentioned the carbon cycle. So the cycle of nutrients coming and going is really important to see how that interacts in the soil. And one of the things we forget about as um, gardeners and horticulturists is that it provides support to structures. So engineers that are building roads, housing foundations, etc., they need to have an engineering report on the soil. So they're very interested in the physical properties of it. Is it going to corrode their concrete or the metal supports that they're using? Will it be stable or is it something that's going to cause, you know, a slide? Is it a, a cliff face on, a, you know, an ocean uh, beach that's going to be falling off? Is it going to be able to hold trees in a windstorm? All these kinds of things are really important. Um, but in particular for engineering purposes, it's that support aspect of it. Now, a lot of times we forget about the soil because we don't see it. It's just down there. It's underneath. Um, but they actually, you know, scientists will say there's more going on under the ground than there is above ground. If you think of all the microorganisms, the animals that live under there, um, it's a vast ecosystem really in there. And those living systems that occur above and below are determined, again, by the soil properties. So if this soil is too wet, too hot, not enough oxygen, the wrong pH, the wrong nutrients, then certain types of microorganisms and animals and plants will not thrive in those soils. And so again, when we, we talk about plants saying they're native to Australia or native to certain parts of South Africa or this or that, it's because of the soil and probably the climate that, with, that all interacts is why they actually are from those areas. And so we try to find plants then that survive in situations very similar to our ecosystem, our type of soil, our climate. And if we can recreate that, then we can actually have a little bit more variety of plants in an area. Now, soil has taught us a lot um, over the years. Some of you may have heard of the dust storm. It's um, had, I believe, an anniversary not too long ago. But this was a situation where we had periods of drought and it got so bad that the soil was not held in by any plants. And so vast windstorms, probably like we had the last few days, took soil and moved it clear across the United States. They said that you could actually be on the, the boardwalks up there, and um, I forget what it's called in New Jersey, the, 
Atlantic City. Atlantic City, those places that there was actually layers of dust that came all the way from the middle part of the United States and was transported by the wind. So if you've ever seen movies where they've you know, simulated dust storms, it's just horrible. And that's all that really good topsoil that was moved away. And so after this time period, the Soil Conservation Service then was developed in the United States. And so our federal government decided that our soil was such a precious resource that we need to do something to conserve it. So there was an agency that was formed to help farmers, to help landowners conserve their soil using wind breaks, using cover crops, um, you know, anything they could do to keep that soil intact, protect it from the wind, keep it in place as much as possible. So it was really a disaster that caused a lot of poverty, a lot of death, a lot of destruction. And, you know, we learned that we need to conserve our soils. Um, sometimes we have so much runoff and siltation that it actually causes problems in other areas. And so, again, it's somewhat of a natural situation that, you know, water goes downhill, gravity carries water, water carries soil. However, if we can stop that, then we can, you know, not worry about these sort of muddy messes. And then desertification or becoming a desert then can happen when, again, you've taken all the nutrients out of the soil, you've taken the organic matter out of the soil, and it's degraded to a point where it cannot support life. If it can't do that, then it just begins to um, sort of self-destruct and become a desert. And so that can be an issue. Now again, that's not why we have deserts necessarily, but a soil that was previously productive can become unproductive if we don't take care of it. Okay, so we of course know that soil is the medium for plant growth, and the things we look for it to do for plants is to give them some structure, in other words, a place to be to hold it in place, hopefully to keep it from blowing over in the wind, so that anchorage is really important. We need the soils to provide moisture and water for the plants, but also oxygen and nutrients. Now, we're also trying to come up with some alternate systems to grow plants without soil. And so if we're using some sort of a gel or perhaps a hydroponic system of some sort, we need to get that water or that artificial means that we're using to do all of these things. It has to give support has to provide water, oxygen, and nutrients. And so we can do that artificially, but we know that naturally our soil is built to do that. Now, we oftentimes talk about soil as being a three-phase system. And the phases that we refer to in here are the solid, the liquid, and then what we refer to as the gas phase. So this is a, an ideal sort of picture or model of what an ideal, typical sort of loamy soil might look like if you were to sort of break it down into a pie chart. So this perfect ideal soil is about 50% solid, and that can be made up of what we call the mineral material that um, is rock that decomposed and formed in a particular area. Organic material, and believe it or not, organic material is typically only about 1 to 5 percent, and that's considered to be ideal in a natural type of soil. A lot of us think, oh, organic you know, matter and organic material, and you can grow plants just in organic material. But out in nature, in sort of a real soil situation, you know, 5 percent is considered really good. Now, on the other part of the soil, we have what's referred to as the pore space. So 50% solid, 50% openings, again, ideal. And half of those openings in this ideal situation, half of them would be filled with water and half of them would be filled with just air. And in that air is oxygen in the soil, and that's what plant roots need to carry on respiration. Just like we breathe oxygen, plant roots also need to breathe oxygen. Now some plants are adapted for wetter situations where there is very little oxygen available, like cattails and some of those plants, and they've figured out other ways to get around that lack of oxygen. 
Some of the plants we heard about today are drought tolerant, but they don't like wet feet, right? They, we heard that they need good drainage, otherwise they're going to have problems. Because they're adapted to a situation that needs a lot more of this oxygen or air in for the root system. So once you understand your plant, you can, you know, or understand your soil, then you can figure out which types of plants will grow best there. It's probably the, the best thing to do. Figure out your soil and then go from there. Um, roots are the thing that interfaces on a plant the most in the soil. And each of these roots forms what we refer to as root hairs. They're the actual kind of microscopic part of the root that's going to be absorbing nutrients and absorbing water. And that will come from here, it will go into the cells and will be transported throughout the plant. And so if we have the pore spaces filled with water, as we might after irrigation or after a rainfall, then they'll begin to absorb that water and then after a bit more oxygen will become available. They'll have the oxygen that they need. So they may be just saturated or wet for a very short time. They can handle that and then they get back in balance with the oxygen. So it's a, a really interesting little cycle. But it's that root hair that's going to be absorbing nutrients, absorbing water, and oxygen, and bringing that into the plant as it needs it. Now, it's not the only <coughs> way that plants can get nutrients or oxygen. They can also get that through their foliage. But most of the time, the only way they're going to get nutrients through their foliage is if we spray something on it. So we can actually use liquid fertilizers, and leaves can absorb that. But the primary way they get nutrients is through the roots. Okay, any questions so far <coughs> about the basics of plants and kind of an overview of soils? Okay, well let's get into soil formation. How did soils get here? How do they form? I think I made a comment earlier that it can take thousands of years to you know, form an inch of soil, kind of the standard quote that you hear. And again, we're talking about native soil, mineral soil, the natural soil. You can actually create your own soil mix and you can, you know, change an area of your garden and create a good healthy soil habitat, um, you know, with bringing in organic matter, bringing in soil from other places and creating a garden. That's something that you can do, but we're talking about what happens sort of in nature. And so these are the five factors classically that affect soil formation and they all work together and so typically we'll start off with a parent material and that can be the type of rock or mineral that is in the earth's crust in that particular area so if your soil is derived from granite it may be totally different from soil that is derived from some of the sandstones and maybe limestones that come up from the ocean area. So coastal soils will be very different from soils closer inland, where they're maybe under a different type of influence, volcanic activity, etc. Um, or you may be in a valley where all of the parent material was washed in at one point. Maybe there was a raging river that used to go through there and it left behind all this sediment and material or where I came from in Ohio, we had glaciers, and glaciers came in, brought in all kinds of rock and material, they retreated, they gouged out, formed lakes, um, ground up rock, all kinds of interesting things happened. So wherever your parent material is, if it's naturally occurring or brought in, that's basically what starts it. And then over time, the climate, whether you have a dry climate or a wet climate, you've got freezing and thawing, all of those things are influencing <coughs> soil. They're breaking up rocks, they're allowing plant seeds to grow, and then those can, again, exude certain chemicals, or when they die, they leave behind organic matter, and that in place then will begin to form the soil. Topography has to do with the lay of the land. Is it flat? Is it mountainous? You know, is there a hillside? So each one of those things, depending if you're high, low, tilted, etc., is also going to have an influence on soil development. And then the organism, plants and animals. 
burrowing animals, earthworms, microbes, plants, trees, shrubs, grasslands. All of these types of plants are going to influence how the soil is formed. So throughout the middle part of the United States, where we have the vast prairies <clears throat> full of grasses and other plants, it's their extremely deep root systems that give them such fertile soils. And so we actually have some of our best soils, the richest soils, Iowa and Illinois and those kinds of places, growing where there once were these vast grasslands. We tend to think that, oh, a tropical rainforest with these huge trees is going to have the most fertile soil. But in reality, it doesn't. The trees hold a lot of that nutrients and materials. Yes, there's leaves falling, but they're decomposing really quickly, and there's not a lot of really great soil that's forming underneath those. It really occurs because of those extremely deep root systems in the grassland areas. And so those are typically much better soils. OK, now I talked a little bit about apparent material. And here's just a little um, chart showing types of parent material and their natural amounts of different minerals and, as a result, different elements that might be naturally there. So let's take a gray granite as compared to maybe what's referred to as a Platteville limestone. Those are kind of the two extremes. The granite is going to be made up of 64% quartz, whereas the limestone maybe only has 7.5%. So as you can imagine, you know, quartz, think beach sand, that's usually a lot of quartz types or sandstone things. They're going to have a lot of that material in it. Well, quartz is actually not really high in a lot of elements. So if we look at calcium, for instance, the limestone has 704, and I forget if this is like tons, or yeah, pounds per ton of rock, 704, whereas granite is only going to have 69 pounds per ton of rock. So a soil that forms from granite is not going to be high in calcium. But if it forms from limestone, it sure will. So naturally, if you're from a, land, a limestone-derived soil, if, if you're closer to the coast or where I grew up or you know, gardened a lot in Ohio, a lot of limestone was there as well. You know, calcium's not your problem. You probably have plenty of calcium in the soil. So you wouldn't necessarily think that you would need to add that as a nutrient. Potassium, pretty good amount of it in granite pretty much missing in limestone. So yeah, our limestone soils are probably deficient in that, and we probably would need to fertilize with that. Uh, magnesium, again, is very iron. Pretty much non-existent in the limestone, but you know, pretty decent amount in the granite or basalt derived soils. Phosphorus, a little bit here, not at all in the sandstone or the limestone. Manganese, again, it varies. So the natural rock that formed your soil may influence the natural nutrients that are there. Is there any sort of a natural rock that's common in the coastal area of San Diego, like any one of those that's most common? I'd say sandstone. Okay. Yeah. So I, now this is um, Hinkley sandstone. I'm thinking, I'm not even sure where that's from. This is probably like a Midwestern you know, comparison of different <clears throat> types of soil. But sandstone is, is pretty similar. It's just started out as sand that was compressed together to form rock, and then it breaks down and weathers. And so I live in um, the La Costa area, and my backyard's got a lot of sandstone in it. So um, pretty familiar with that. So again, nutrient-wise, not great. <laughs> just about, you know, there are some plants that do well in there, like the acacias. They seem to love it and do just fine. Don't have to do a thing to them. But if I was trying to grow vegetables or a turf or whatever, it would need a lot more nutrients. And so, again, depending on what your natural soil is, that's different. Now, the question is, is do you have the natural native soil where you garden? Many times in subdivisions, guess what? They took all that good stuff away, <laughs> yeah. built your house on it, 
And then if you'd like to garden, you know, you need to go buy it back from someplace. <laughs> now, the nice thing is, is I have heard of some new sustainable communities that are actually scraping off that topsoil so that engineers can do their foundations and do their thing. They're stockpiling it, and then they're putting it back in place, which is so cool. But that doesn't always happen. So we oftentimes say in our urban soil situation, we have what's called disturbed soil, or the urban land complex, which means basically that it's whatever it is. Who knows sometimes. But, um, but again, it does give you an idea that depending on your parent material, just like your parents you know, gave you certain characteristics, the soil is also going to have certain characteristics based on that. Now again, we mentioned that soils can form in place, but they can also be transported. So you may be in a situation where, you know, wind was what brought it in. So maybe if you're close to the coast, it may be wind-driven, you know, that constant breeze or wind that comes in. Sand dunes are a great example of that. Um, sometimes water moves. And you'll see some words like alluvial, that just means like maybe a river brought it in or some flowing body of water, or marine sediments. And apparently in the Imperial Valley, that is quite a bit of what's there. Um, and that's what's been left behind. So you have to know a little bit about the geology of an area to kind of understand maybe what parent material is actually there. So as you're driving around, you know, across the state or across the United States, if you see road cuts, Sometimes it's really interesting to see that geology and the layers that are there. And kind of interesting to see, okay, hmm, you know, it's not just flat layers. Sometimes there's uplifts and, and different things happening. So it really is not only, you know, things being brought in, but it could also be volcanic type activity as the mountain ranges form and all that. And again, gravity has a big influence on different types of soils. So it can form in place or it can be brought in. Now the climate is a little more detail on that. We include temperature and temperature in particular is going to control the rate of chemical reactions. And you know chemistry 101 you probably did some experiment where you did it in cold and then some <coughs> in hot and things happen a little bit faster typically in the warmer situations. Same thing with soils. Um, it's also going to affect plant growth. So the soils that form in an area that freezes in the winter time is going to be different than soils that form in an area that's always temperate or even tropical. And so the soils that form in those locations are going to be totally different. And then again, organic matter breakdown to release nutrients further into the soil is also going to be influenced by temperature. Happens faster in warm temperatures slows down when it's really cold. So when I said there's something like 13,000 soil types, by the time you take these five factors and mess them up with all of the different potentials of types of parent material, types of climate, you know, the soil that's down here could be totally different from the soil here, totally different from the soil on top of the mountain, totally different in, you know, the next neighborhood, etc. So if you ever look at a soil map, it's this really interesting, almost like a topographical map in a way, and then it will actually give you boundaries of different soil types. And we'll talk about those a little bit later in the class and how you can access those. Um, rainfall is also going to influence what's going on. Again, the chemical reactions, plant growth, organic matter, etc. And then also, if we're going to have erosion, you know, if we have an area that hardly ever gets rain, not much is going to happen. Not a lot of plants are going to grow there. There's not going to be a lot of movement of the soil. Uh, wind, though, can be very significant in areas where wind is an issue. And again, if it's loose soil, smaller particles, finer particles, they'll get transported with that wind. Now, the organic matter or the life the biotic factor, the organisms, are also going to affect it. So plants, animals, insects, microbes, don't forget, microbes, very influential in soils. Um, one place you can actually see soil forming, not exactly right before your eyes, but you can see very young soils. If you ever go to Hawaii and see where new lava has flowed, 
you know, that is parent material, okay, in its sort of most basic form. And then over time, you may go further away from an active volcano and find areas where there's lots of ash maybe that's settled, or perhaps lichens that are beginning to grow on that rock. And then over time, they will decompose. Seeds will blow in. They'll start to get a little foothold in there. They'll die. Those plants, organic matter will begin to build up. And then, not before you know it, but in you know, hundreds of years or so, they'll begin this little thin layer of soil that's going to form. So next time you go to Hawaii, take a look around, and you'll see some very interesting young soils in some areas there. And then over time, again, that that one last factor, these plants and animals are going to live and die and burrow. We may have freezing and thawing and other things that are going to be, you know, making cracks and crevices for, you know, little seeds to get in there. And you can kind of see how that soil actually develops. And again, exposure, if it's on a slope or if it's very flat, is going to influence how this soil forms, how fast, if plants are going to be able to grow on it, if animals are going to be able to live there, et cetera. So it gets to be quite complex. And then again, our, our last factor is time. It just takes time for all this to happen. And so the climate, the organisms, parent material, topography are all forming. And we can have what we refer to as very simple young soils where we just have organic matter over rock. That's kind of the beginning. And then as soils mature, they get deeper and deeper and begin to form different layers over time. Now, here's an example of what some of these layers can look like as they develop horizons. Again, a very young soil, immature, is just organic matter on top of rock or parent material. Um, but over time, with plants working in that, decomposing, roots going down into it. They're going to be taking nutrients, cycling nutrients back in. Some are going to be leached down below that. And you can see down in here that we've got you know, the parent material and then these intermediate layers. And it's that little dark thin layer maybe up there that's kind of the, the topsoil, the, the precious part that is the best for plants to grow in. Now here's our sort of classic poster child of, of soil um, under maybe a turf here. And we have oftentimes what's referred to as an organic horizon, which is mostly organic matter in that top two inches. Then what we refer to as the top soil may be that 10 inch layer or A. Below that is B that we refer to as the subsoil and then C is the parent material. And you can notice that the plant roots, well, it's hard to see here, but they're most abundant in this A layer. But some of them actually do come down into the B layer. The B layer oftentimes is where you have the clays that are there. We oftentimes refer to this as the subsoil, sometimes the zone of accumulation, because a lot of things leach down into that layer that are bad. Um, but oftentimes, this is going to be composed mostly of clay-type minerals. And if you're in a typical subdivision, this is what the bulldozers come in and take off because it's not that good for building on. But you get much stronger and stronger as you go down here. And so oftentimes, you know, the bulldozers have taken off the good stuff. They've left you with this to make your, you know, nice flat lawn area maybe, or your driveway, or your building foundation. And then it's like, bye-bye, <laughs> good luck <laughs> after that. And this is really not your best soil. This is more what we refer to as a subsoil. So again, this is the really good stuff, typically in the upper inches of the soil, because that's where it's most influenced by those plants and animals. We typically have the best water relationships there. We have the best oxygen mix the best pH, the best nutrients, and so those other organisms, plants, animals, microbes, all do best in that topsoil area. 
This is typically not as well aerated, doesn't drain as well, and may even have accumulations of bad types of chemicals in there, perhaps, um, or an overabundance of something, but maybe not enough of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium um, that plants would like. And so those can be um, significantly different. Okay. I want to start talking a little bit about physical properties, because this is something that we're going to be spending quite a bit of time on, looking at what we refer to as texture, structure, color. So these are the things that we can observe and measure, what we call the physical properties, as opposed to chemical properties. Okay? And these have a really big influence on how we manage the soils. So once we can understand our texture and structure and the color, it's going to give us some clues. And you may notice, especially as we get through the break, you know, take a peek at everybody else's soil and see if you see different colors. Somebody may have one that's more orange in color. Somebody's maybe more black, more gray, more kind of tan, sandy color. Those are all going to tell us something about that soil, maybe the parent material maybe under the, the conditions under which it was formed, et cetera. But once we understand that, we'll have a little bit of a clue of what's happening in what we call the physical properties. So our engineers are really interested in physical properties. They want to know how you know, load-bearing it is. Is it going to have the structure that's going to shift or expand and contract? Shifting and expanding and contracting are not real good for building foundations or road foundations. Okay? So they would avoid those or they'd do something special about that. Is it prone to landslides? That sort of thing. Um, but we want to know more about drainage, right? And is it going to hold enough water but yet drain properly? Uh, what kind of chemicals can it hold? So we're more interested in those types of things as gardeners. Okay, so our first one we're going to talk about is color. And again, that can give us some clues about either nutrient composition, organic matter, perhaps even drainage in the soil. And there actually is a color chart. It's called the Munsell System of Color Notation, um, where just like you have paint chips or you know, a decorator might go around with color swatches, etc., there's actually colors of soil that are out there. And so a soil scientist would have a little color chart as you see here, and they would hold it up to the soil and try to see, okay, is it this color or that shade of gray, or does it have green in it, or whatever. And that sometimes will tell them then, okay, what nutrients might be there? Was it formed under excellent drainage and aeration, or was it done in sort of a wet situation? So for instance, if you see a lot of dark black colors in the soil, that is going to be indicative of organic matter. So those of you that have dark stains in your water or lots of stuff floating up at the top, you can actually see the organic matter in there and it's actually staining your water. Your soil color may be very dark. Okay. If you were formed in an area that had clay minerals that were well aerated, they may actually be more reddish or perhaps orange or yellow in color. And so oxidation or rusting, so to speak, in the presence of oxygen is what's giving it those orange colors. So types of minerals formed under well aerated conditions then will give you that um, type of a, a look. If it was in a very wet situation, it may actually be gray. And some of these um, samples that I've had sitting around for you know a year or two where it's been anaerobic in there, they actually begin to turn gray. But if you um, dig out soil from an area that's constantly wet, maybe the bottom of a pond or an area that's kind of a wet low spot. Do you ever notice how it's not only stinky, but it's kind of gray in color? Mm -hmm. Lack of oxygen is causing that, okay? And again, it could just be the type of clay mineral too. Uh, we talk about Georgia clay, and it's bright reddish orange, okay? So it's a type of clay mineral, and that mineral happens to be oxidized, it's warmer, it's got a lot of um, aerobic activity going on, and so it turns more of an orange color. Uh, where I came from in Ohio, our clay there was more of a tan color. Not as well drained, so it was a little bit different. Okay, texture. Now this is one that's kind of a weird concept because the definitions of texture 
are different from what we might think of as texture in a normal sense. But in the sort of soil lingo, it's the relative proportion of sand, silt, and clay-sized particles. So even sand means something a little different to a soil scientist. It actually is a size category. Silt is a size category. Clay is a type of mineral, a type of soil, and also a size category. So the word clay is probably the most confusing one. But if you can at least think of sand-sized particles as being large, silt as being kind of medium-sized, and clay as being the smallest. So I like to say sometimes if you kind of think of you know, some of these sand-sized particles as being basketballs, okay? And then the silt-sized particles down here, very small, maybe a pea size, relatively speaking, and then a period in a sentence is being the size of the clay particle. So relatively speaking, sand-sized particles are huge, and clay-sized particles are extremely small. And because of those physical sizes, they actually give different characteristics to a soil. So the particle size, again, you can kind of see the relative sizes here, is actually going to have different amounts of surface area depending on those particle sizes. So if we had a volume of clay-sized particles, and for instance, I, I brought along some different objects here to kind of give you a little bit more of a look here. But let's say if we think of these golf balls in this jar as being sand-sized particles, okay? They're very large. The pore spaces between them are very large. So we would expect excellent drainage, lots of air, oxygen in this type of situation. Okay, this next one's unfortunately not as clear and easy to see, but I've got these beads here. If these are our silt-sized particles, they're very, you know, small comparatively. But if we had a jar the same size filled up with them, we would have much smaller pore spaces, and we would have a lot more surface area in this particular soil sample. Likewise, I brought along a little container of seed beads, extremely tiny, the little tiniest beads you can get, usually. And again, in this particular volume, we might be able to get one golf ball, right? And maybe, oh, 30 of those silk-sized beads. But these guys, I've probably got, you know, hundreds or thousands in here. Lots and lots of surface area, extremely small <coughs> particle sizes, very tiny pore spaces, so water is going to drain much more slowly through here. Okay, it's going to get caught and has to go through all those little tiny spaces. It's not going to be as well aerated, there's just not those big air spaces in these clay sized particles. So we've got very small pores. We call those the micropores, it would be with the clay size. And then larger macropores and the golf ball size or the sand size particles.